Hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, our next presenter is Jud Judson. Is it Judson or Judson? It's Judson. Judson Chak Chuak. Is it? Is it the way you spell your name? Okay. Judson Chak Chuak. I'm sorry for my pronunciation. I'm not. I didn't come from Myanmar. So um, the title of the paper entitled uh, the, the paper entitled Encountering Islamic Culture Toward a Kingdom Model. Avi toward a kingdom model salvation okay now let's give time for Judson to share what he has researched so far um thank you so much ads for allowing me to present my paper here and thank you johan for uh, introducing me but by the way uh, i'm not from myanmar i'm from india so just a little bit <laughs> correction um Before I came here, I was thinking whether I should read my paper, tell my paper, or explain my paper. But when I came in here, I, see, I saw a lot of people who are not from the seminary. If I read it, it would be very boring for you. And I don't want to be boring. I'm still in my 20s. I, yet. I can be boring when I'm old, but not now. So um, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, the tree. So. My, uh, uh, by the way, when I submitted my abstract, I did not know that the FIFA World Cup season uh, uh, is in conflict. Uh, I mean, uh, FIFA was happening. FIFA World Cup was happening. If I knew it, I might not do it. So I saw, at some point, I sort of regret it. But now uh, I'm very, <laughs> uh, I'm very glad that I was able to finish my paper. And because of that, I, ha uh, I had to not watch some of the FIFA games, so I make a little bit sacrifice. So <laughs> that's the reason why it's very important for me to communicate to you, for you to understand it. So I will try my best to uh, make it very simple for you, and at the same time, without failing to uh, challenge your thinking. So um, let's... That's the title, Encountering Islamic Culture Toward a Kingdom Model Salvation. Uh, I modified a little bit from my abstract. So introduction, uh, let's, now I have my abstract here. Instead of, read, instead of me reading it, I'll just let you read. I'll just give you about three minutes. This is my abstract. Are you done? Okay, let me share one of my secrets before I start. When I found out that most of my professors do not really read my assignment, do not really read my reading reports, I found a way uh, to make my life easier. What I did was that whenever I read article or a book, I just read the abstract and the conclusion and write a report based on what I thought the author actually said it. So um, this is my abstract, and you already have a basic idea of what I am uh, about to uh, explain today. So if you read the abstract carefully, you can see that I have to deal a little bit, I have to deal uh, with a little bit of anthropology and theology, history, and biblical studies. So uh, let's go. Uh, here I have an outline. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So. Uh, my, this is, I just presented my introduction, that is the abstract, and I explained the dynamic of is Islamic honor shame culture, the horror of shame, I use a very strong word, horror, uh, I will explain this later, and the pursuit of honor, westernization, a pitfall of Christian mission, I will explain more about it, correct theology in wrong society, the prominence of honor shame dynamic in the Bible, presenting the gospel as it is and, and as it is and as it was and is. Here I talk about the importance of doing history. So let's go to the next slide. The neglected backdrop teaching of the Bible. This is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God anticipated uh, anticipation in the first century, 
and then I go to the arrival of the kingdom and I do my conclusion and implication. So uh, I presented this just so that you know the, the flow of my argument. The horror of shame. Is the, in Islamic honor, shame culture, shame is the main motivator of maintaining social status. It is the feeling of complete dismiss and inadequacy. It also is the feeling of anxiety, embarrassment, and fear of public opinion. When a person behaves in such a way contrary to the, uh, to the social, uh, societal norm, he is considered as a shame person. Even though the Quran defines what is right and wrong, it does not have a right and wrong list. Therefore, the society is the one uh, who dictates what is accept acceptable and what is not acceptable. There are certain types of shame. When you do some shameful acts, that is considered as shame. But the most shameful, uh, the most Intense shame comes from being certain type of person. For example, being an orphan, widow, or if, you are, if some of my, your family is a drug dealer, that's one of the most intense shame that you can experience. Shame afflicts both individuals and groups. The pain of living with should not be understated. Many groups and individuals have taken extreme actions to cope with shame. According to the United General Assembly, every year there are 5,000 5, women, women who were killed because of shame. This is called honor killing or shame killing. For example, when, when a young girl is involved in premarital pre sex or teenage pregnancy, that is very shameful for the, for the family. So. The only way to escape shame for the family is death. That is why we should not take shame. We should not understate shame. We should take shame seriously. A shame person by himself cannot do much to fix social vandalism. He needs new identity and transformation of self to manage shame. Public restoration of honor Public restoration of honor to the shame person is only possible when it is done by an honorable person. The pursuit of honor. Honor is one of the highest values, if not highest value, of Islamic culture. People of this culture live and die for honor. And there are two types of honor, according to Manila. Uh, Malina, forgive me. Uh, it's called ascribe honor and acquire honor. Ascribe honor is the honor which uh, you get because of being in an honorable family. And acquired honor, in order to get acquired honor, you have to do certain honorable deeds. So I will not go much uh, on the honor shame thing, uh, honor shame dynamic, because we all. Asia is a honor, most of the countries in Asia, in, in Asia is honor shame country and we are in honor shame and we can uh, relate to it very much. Um, so, westernization, a pitfall of Christian mission. Westernization has been, yesterday has been defined by uh, Mam Dizon. I, I will not, I, I, however, I will give my own definition. Westernization is a process whereby Religions and societies adopt the Western values, ideas, standards, lifestyle, and philosophy. In some ways, uh, it is theologically harmful for Islamic honor shame people because the theology it carries with is formulated in terms of guilt, innocent, which reflect the Western values. Now, anthropologists say that there are uh, there are three main uh, three basic cultures, three, uh, they, 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 they categorize as, uh, they, they categorize cultures in three main uh, forms. One is the innocent guilt culture, this is the Western culture, and honor shame culture is the 
Asia and Africa and some other part of the world. And there, we also have power, fear culture. So the theology uh, which the Western presented is a remedy of guilt, which is actually based on their uh, societal values. Doing theology is like contextualization. It is the process of feeling ways through appropriately expressed biblical principles to local, uh, to local context and situation. Theology, if done properly, will always be contextual. Other ways, even if you do theology, a correct theology, and present that theology to uh, some, some uh, societies, even though your theology is correct, it will not be relevant to them. Luther and Augustine still skillfully presented the guilt model salvation. They find the remedy of guilt in Romans. And they, the gospel that they presented, uh, the discovery shape therefore they presented, influenced the Christian world. It changed the way Christian present and understand God. Because guilt transcends culture and time, this aspect of the gospel is very crucial. And it has changed many lives. However, guilt-based gospel fail to see the other aspect of the gospel. The gospel is not only one dimensional. It has many dimensions. It also is partial and limited by cultural blinder. Unfortunately, most Christians missionary present the guilt-based gospel as if it is the only way of expressing the gospel. Now, I will go to the prominence of honor, shame, dynamic in the Bible. Uh, in order to save my time, I'll just show you this picture. In the Bible, we have many honor, shame language. This is what I call honor synonyms, like uh, honor, shame synonyms. I mean, the red ones are the honor synonyms, and the black ones are the shame synonyms. And let's go to the next slide. And we also have honor metaphors. Shame metaphors, rejected, death, mock, weed, etc., etc. And let's go to the next slide. And these are the owner metaphors. Child, clean, owner, friend, son, heal, citizen, strong. Let's go to the next slide. And these are the this is the owner shame metaphors. Let's go to the next. Shame, and this is what I call uh, what called the shame association, like sickness, persecution, impurity, pride, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And these are the owner associations. So uh, there are also certain way, uh, different ways of expressing owners. Like, for, for example, they express honor and same dynamics through the narrative, like uh, when Esther was honored by God, and there are many other, narr the other narratives which uh, you can see the honor shame dynamic. And also genealogy. Genealogy is often missed by the West runners, but it is very important for a collectivistic society. You remember in Matthew, the, the, the genealogy of Jesus starts from David, King David, in order to present Jesus as the honorable king. The importance of doing history, presenting the gospel as it is and, it, and it, as it was and is. Since the gospel happened in honor shame society and transformed the first century world, the honor shame Islamic society needs to listen the gospel in its own terms and significance. They need to hear the gospels in their own voices and words. There are danger of ignoring the historical context of the biblical text, Harmonetics 101. Ignoring the historical context of the text can result to an injection of the context that is foreign to the original context. And if the historical context is ignored, there's a tendency to insert and read the 21st century problems into the text. There's no such thing as plain reading of the Bible. Whether you want it or not, 
there will you you always read the Bible through a context, whether it is your own context or other context. Uh, I'll go to the next section. The neglected bedrock teaching of uh, the Bible. The kingdom of God was prominent theme of the teaching of Jesus and that of the apostles, but it is no longer prominent in Christianity today. One author blames the different views on eschatology, the kingdom of because uh, we have like the premillennialism and uh, um, the dispensationalism, uh, different explanation about the millennium, the range of God. Uh, that's the reason why the kingdom of God is so complicated for many Christians to understand. And the other one is that the American successful revolt against the uh, the British monarchs. They were when, uh, when the they were against the kingly rule since the Independence Day. That's what he suggests as the reason why it is not so prominent today. I don't know if you agree it or not. The arrival of the kingdom itself is presented as the good news. Read Mark 1, 14 and 15. The kingdom of God becomes the message of Jesus, the core message of Jesus. In the first century, the Jews, even though the Jews were in their own land, they were still considered as exile. Uh, let's see the slides here, John. So these are the characteristics of exile. The Old Testament uh, prophets uh, wrote about this. Number one, expul expulsion from the land. Number two, decline of spirituality due to suppression. Lack of economic security and political stability. These are the signs of exile. And in the first century, even though the Jews were in their own land, they were still experiencing this except for the first one, they were in their own land. And there were also certain characteristics of restore Israel. And we can go to the next slide now. Number one, restoration of the land, economic and political prosperity, restoration of spirituality, the coming of the Messiah. In the first century, these do not seem to happen. For the Jews, the most painful thing for the uh, the most painful thing was not the high taxation, the aliens' law, or the brutality of the oppression, but the most painful thing was that they were under foreign rule, and these foreigners were pagan. Imagine the people of God being under the rule of foreign, and the foreigners were pagan. This this was the most painful for them. Due to this, there were. At least, there were more, but let, uh, for the sake of the time, I say at least four different groups. One is the Dead Sea community, the Qumran community, who separated themselves from the world and waited for God to act. The second one, the, Sadduce the Sadducees, who got along with the politics of Rome. The third, the Pharisees, who tried to usher God's kingdom by keeping the law perfectly. The fourth were the Zealots, who sharpened their swords and fought a, hol a holy fight in expectation of military victory over against Rome and theological victory against evil, the kingdom arrival. Mark summarizes uh, Jesus' message with these words, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at, at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Both Mark and Matthew attribute Jesus' preaching as the gospel. This is interesting because in the first century, when Caesar has a message, whether the message is pleasant, whether it was good or not, it doesn't matter. They call it Evangelion, good news, gospel. But whatever came out of the emperors were considered a saving message which would change the world for the better. The gospel writers adopt the word evangelion and attribute the kingdom as evangelion, gospel. By using this word, they inform their readers that Israel God, not Caesar, is Lord and in church and beginning to act 
in and through Jesus to save the world. The real Lord of the world is in action. There is a real power structure which stands in contrast to the power and policy of Caesar. Therefore, it is time for the Qumran community, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Zealots to give up their kingdom agendas and trust in the way of Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount is more than a moral code and a message to find salvation in Jesus. It is an invitation to live in a, to live in a kingdom life. It demands the kingdom people to give up their revolutionary zeal. For example, the text which says, do not, receive, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn, to the, uh, try, turn the other to him. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whatever forces, whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. These words constitute a warning not to get involved in the ever present resistant movement. The kingdom of God challenges and invites people to change their mind and have new trust and hope. It introduces a different power and order which the people of God can live by. Jesus is the, bringing or the bringer of the king, the bringer and the king of this kingdom. Everywhere he went, he introduced the kingdom by his words and actions. He challenged and redefined honor, the core value of his culture. This, however, does not mean that the kingdom of God is against culture. Jesus was not counter-cultural. He was counter-structural. If he was counter-structural, he would deny the importance of honor. He never said that honor is not important, but instead he redefines honor. This is seen in the Last Supper scene. When no one wants to wash their feet, Jesus said, let me wash it. This is a way of honor in the kingdom of God. Jesus demonstrated in that in his, Jesus demonstrated that in his kingdom, shame regains honor, and he and the honorable king, he the honorable king himself is the one to restore honor to his citizen. In the prodigal son parable, you can see the father restores the honor of his disgraceful son with robe, ring, and a big face. The parable of the great dinner in Luke 14 is the story of this honor people being honored by the king in his kingdom banquet. When, the, when they enter the kingdom, they have eternal life. The, entering the kingdom and having eternal life is used as synonyms. The prerequisite of, this enter, of entering this kingdom is to believe in the way of Jesus, the kingdom bringer, and to repent. The kingdom people are to submit themselves to the rule and range of God. They are to make the world a better place. Mark 5, 13 to 16. Uh, Matthew 5, 13 to 16. They are to treat each other with honor. They are to bear fruit by making disciples. By the way, a call to discipleship is a call to preach the kingdom of God. If you, don't, if you doubt it, reach, read Luke 9, 60. Conclusion. The guilt model salvation focuses on the remedy of guilt. While it is appropriate and effective to present it to the Western guilt innocent society, it might not sound as good as it is in the Islamic honor shame society. Kingdom salvation model, on the hard other hand, speaks in, ter in the terminology and language that are familiar to the honor shame people. It addresses their primary concern and offers new identity to them. This identity is offered by Jesus himself. In his kingdom, honor is neither based on ethnicity, educational background, or past experience. Not even the absence of shame in one's life or family bring honor. In fact, maximum honor is ascribed not to the ones who, experience, who never experience shame, but to the ones who overcome shame. In, 
the Islamic uh, society try to escape shame at all costs. But in this kingdom, Jesus, the king himself, received maximum honor. All authority on earth has been given to me by undergoing shame, the maximum shame by the cross, by undergoing the cross, through the cross. Therefore, the honor shame Muslims have chance in the kingdom, a chance to be honorable people of God's kingdom. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jason, for the, for the wonderful presentation. So now it's time for Q and A. And any questions from the audience? Anyone? Any hands? No. Okay. Last chance. No. No more question. Okay. So. Silence means consent. Oh, sorry. I did not see. Who? <laughs> so, question? Oh, Pastor Guizzo. Okay. No, no, it's okay. But then, Oh, wonderful. Um, mine is not a question, even though the moderator is asking for questions. Relax, it's not a question. It's, it's just uh, uh, appreciation, an appreciation to the effect that um, here is somebody who is developing a perspective of doing theology um, in a milieu where the prism of doing theology is drawn from a world view that is predominantly Western and makes it very hard for mission to advance. You know, since we are talking about mission from yesterday, and I think this is one of the key issues that we probably need to invest more time to, to develop uh, methodologies, to develop ways of reaching our people in our context and remain faithful uh, to scripture and develop those uh, biblical principles which we cannot do away with and yet reach our people our own way. And I'm just thinking, uh, could it be that uh, when we do that which resonates very well with our people in the Asian context here and um, um, when we abandon that and adopt in the name of what is the scholarly, that's the time we also begin to experience decline in our way of doing, you know, mission, you know, as it were. So mine is basically to appreciate uh, my brother's presentation that uh, I think this is something as a house, as participants in this forum, need to take seriously and, and, and develop and maybe develop some little knowledge of just drinking volumes and books because they are produced somewhere with a certain worldview and what's, what's enunciated in there may not necessarily work in Manila. It may not necessarily be applicable here um, as it were. So thank you so much for, for brainstorming us to, yeah, so it's not a question, it's just, it's just a comment. Thank you so much. Can I comment one? Um, actually, there is one. Uh, I. I like when you say that this might be the reason why uh, there are certain decline. There's one author who says that the guilt model salvation, the Western theology, he points out the limitation of this theology and he says it stops at the cross. Meaning to say it does not address much uh, the life of the believer after they accept Jesus. But the kingdom of God, I think, is addressing what the believers should do and how sh they should behave in the kingdom, like the ethics of the kingdom, right? So, yeah. Okay, that's all. Oh, wait, final question. Oh. 
So I'm so, I'm so sorry, doctor. Maybe you can save the question for the next presenter. Oh, <laughs> oh wait, different presenter. Oh yeah. <laughs>